reading from the newspaper today, it was just like that that was something else or that is something else. But I'm getting tired of reading about it. Just about <laughs> had enough of it. That's just like both of them said that Crimea is Russian. It will always be Russian. It was Russian before the so-called invasion. Get over it. <laughs> but they were, uh, I read an interview with one of those generals. He said, they're occupying Crimea, but they won't be long. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do they mean by it won't be long? Um, because this Ukrainian general has the mindset that they're going to take it back. Crimea was was U more Ukrainian than it was Russian when Russia took it. But they're they going to take it back from the from, from the Russians. The Russians occupy it. Oh, okay. But when we say in that they invaded Crimea, that's not exactly true. There was a base the Ukraines had leased to the Russians, and all they did was take their people that were in the Crimea and, and just step out of the base and secure the area. Just in everybody's patience. It's not quite what they tell you. They didn't invade the Crimea. It's just another part of the puzzle. Yeah, yeah. It's like listening to somebody complain about another person. I'd say there's three sides to every story. Depends on who the person is. Uh, no, no. <laughs> there's three sides to every I story. <laughs> what he said, what she said, and, and what really is. So somewhere in the middle is or it's what really is. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I wouldn't believe much of anything I hear out of Washington, D.C., just between you and me. Yeah, it's a... And the thing is, you can't get all of this in one place. All of this information is not found on one place. Oh, you got gosh, to read. No. You got to read several sites. Yeah, you're reading five, six, seven, eight sites of news a day and trying best, to keep up. The best thing to do is read both sides read the far left and the far right because both of them give you pieces the other omit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep yep i always accuse him of being a closet liberal <laughs> you gotta well, read it whenever whenever we watch the news you know he would <laughs> get up in the morning he watched it was Coffee with Joe. Or yeah, yeah. You know? I'd be hollering and at the he, TV. He's hollering, screaming at the TV. Then he turns it to Fox, and then a little bit later, he's, you know, watching it. I said, "You're a closet liberal." No. He's like, well, you have to know what the other side. Is. That's why I just read now. Well, I do. I, that, I, that's I, all. We, I don't watch don't, anything. I just don't read. Watch any news. I haven't watched the news in two years. Yeah. I mean, sometimes even reading makes me want to throw a brick at the. But place. I can just stop reading. That's what I do. Just X. Actually, I put it in one of my folders in case I calm down and want to come back and finish it. We haven't watched the I was reading one. And Lord only knows why I've tried to read it. It was from the Atlantic. Why the guy was the guy was writing why it's such a good thing that Biden's in president now and not Trump. <laughs> You know, and, and I read some of those articles and it's like uh, liberal site going uh, inflation only hurts the rich people. It doesn't hurt the middle class. And it's like, yeah, the pump asks you when you pull up to fuel up, are you rich or are you poor? You get a different price if you're poor. <laughs> and then another article was you ought to be happy there's inflation. Now you can get a pay raise. <laughs> This makes no sense. <laughs> I hope these people are Democrats that they're talking about. Well, they are, but I don't even know that they would be good Democrats. And I don't think they're not the same as the '60s and '70s Democrats. They're, oh no, it's no. They're they're I guess we'd call them hard left. Basically, they're social 
You're socialist, socialist communist. You're I mean, socialist that's communist. You're not a Democrat. The, the, the worst part of it is, is it used to be we could have a lively debate. We could get upset, but then walk away, be friends, and nowadays, no. That's what they used to do in the 80s. I was reading Tip O'Neill and all them. They'd get in the room and fight. Then they'd go eat lunch together and come back and fight. <laughs> Tip O'Neill played cards with uh, Ronald Reagan. They got more accomplished at their weekly card game. Yep. But you see him on TV, just lambasting me. Some of it too, but Phil said, "Got to ham it up for that for that camera." Yeah. Now I guess Luke, he didn't say that Luke. <laughs> That's what it is today. It's putting your finger up what way is the wind blowing, and that's which way I'm going. But I, what I don't like about it is because it used to be fun just to debate someone with a different opinion. But nowadays, they want to crush you. You just can't have a different opinion. You must be yeah, You can't buy and sell toilet paper after they get done with you. You're toast. <laughs> Speaking of which. Oh, Chase, was that. I got on a rabbit trail. Somebody was asking me a question, and man, we ended up on a rabbit Good, trail. Right. Toilet paper is, is all of rolls. Well, it's fascinating that it is basically a new phenomenon when it goes to history. Because I was I wonder if they were they were complaining about the la lack of female facilities in the sports arenas. I said, no, they got the same size room. They just they don't have stalls like men have. So like I said, I wonder if the Roman arenas have restrooms. Well, I can't find that yet, but the Romans did have giant public, public toilets. Any dividers, but yes. they didn't have toilet paper. They had a sponge no. on the stick that you just kept with vinegar and water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they that. were talking about why the spread of disease happened so easily because of that, because it just, <laughs> yep, you shared. That just... You know, well, you know, yeah. Because <laughs> people matter has got a lot of bacteria. Oh, oh, absolutely. But did we say last night that uh, people wouldn't believe some of the things we talked about on the edition? But it was uh, Pompeii was what opened a lot of that up to be found because everything, when, when Vesuvius erupted, it just yes. froze it in time. And they learned all about the restrooms. I thought you were going to go where there was an article the other day that originally uh, toilet paper was 650 sheets. Oh, my gosh. Who has time? <laughs> and and they're cutting the size of the toilet roll now. I think it's going to be 340 sheets. It has been 375, <laughs> but the price is going to stay the same. <laughs> oh my God. Well, this is the type during inflation right. things that they do. Whether it's chips or an eight and a half uh, ounce bag, it's going to be seven and a half. We ate at the mall on Sunday and we sat down to Sheila and said, they shrunk the size of the plates, and they did. I mean, it's a plate lunch at Kelly's Cajun Kitchen, and now they get the smaller. Don't have the big styrofoam ones. It's a smaller one. It's about a quarter of the size is knocked off of it. So it looks like you got as much, but you didn't. Same price. Same. Well, actually, a little bit more. Walmart's carrying that little thing. It's a bidet that you add to your toilet. You just clip it on. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think we probably better open our Bibles before we go too far. <laughs> I never thought of coffee filters, though. There's another good alternative. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 10. But just before we um, just before we get started, we have been asked once again to sponsor uh, First Baptist Christian. Christian Academy in their uh, color run. We've done it like the last two years for sure. I can't say if we've done it more than that, but at least I know the last two years we try to support them. 
And it's always the money goes to making improvements for their classrooms, things of that nature. I'm sure y'all probably, I don't know if y'all know about it or not, because you can run with your, with Corley if you want to in, in the April. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, um, Bubba and Allie know about it. And so I'm presenting it to you. I was asked for us to consider this again. I go on record. I'm always, I'm always up to supporting them. Um, but I'm not going to presume that y'all want to continue to support them in doing this. Um, typically, there's three levels, 755, 100, 250. Typically, we do the 750, but I'm open to, to ideas or suggestions. Anybody agree with him? I agree. Anybody have any questions or comments? I didn't hear the number you gave. 750. Okay. A step is what we I know we've done it two years in a row. I don't know if we it may, it may be more than that. We may have been doing it for five years. I don't I don't know. But I know that we've done the, the 750 and they tell you you get recognition and all that. That's not why we do it. Um, but it's just a support. And because a lot of the kids here do go there. And so we try to support it. So I will take care of that. Thank you. Dennis Beaver says he agrees to. He's online. He's on record. He's on record. <laughs> yeah, but we're not starting voting by proxy. That's. <laughs> Imagine what, man, we could have a business meeting and a half if everybody could get online. Huh? All right. We're in Matthew chapter 10 and we are in verse 34, 33 and 34 uh, is where we, we dropped off. And I'm going to pick up with verse 34, even though we started talking about it and Sometimes I, I do expect somebody to raise a question and I'm because I'm, I'm looking at the same thing you see. And things pop into my mind where if, if, if there was a professor standing here and Luke was sitting in the pew, he'd be like, excuse me, are you going to address the elephant in the room? So there's an elephant in the room in verse 34. Now, Jesus is talking again. Chapter 10 is talking to his disciples. He's explaining to them what is coming in verse 33. If you look close, he warned them about denying him. If they were to deny him before men, that he would deny them before his father in heaven. That's true for us as well. But he says in verse 34, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. What's the elephant in the room? Somebody got to ask. Even if we can't answer it, we got to think about it. He's saying he ain't bringing peace. But well, he's the prince of peace. Isn't he? Okay. What about in regards to this book that we've already studied? Well, I'm thinking the same thing. Huh? Daniel? Which book? Which book? Matthew. <laughs> okay. I was studying because <laughs> yeah. I thought we were yeah, could be so looking I, at Daniel or no, no. okay. <laughs> so, the book of Matthew, and the words would even be in red because well, Jesus, Jesus was speaking. Said it? Jesus said it. Blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers. Jesus just said now, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. Is he schizophrenic? No. Nope. No, he's talking about something different. It's completely different. He's talking about when he comes now, the, the second coming. That's peace within versus peace on earth. Well, we should be striving to not be offensive to people as far as I have a short temper or I don't have a gate over my mouth or my lips, but the peace is, is there are two different kinds of peace. Um, think in terms of who's dominating who right now in the, in the text, the Romans. the Romans are dominating the Israelites. What do they want? They would like for him to bring a sword and put the Romans down to put the Romans down, which would mean peace on earth right. from their respective. We already know the rest of the story, but there is no peace with them because the religious leaders have no problem with murdering somebody. They don't like talking about how people treat you. They couldn't even have a good conversation in their day. He also said that if I have it, the sword is going to cut asunder. The sword, to me, the sword he's talking about right here is, is people's hearts. Um, 
He's going to see which one's good and which one's bad. But yeah, but in this context, it's going to be peace is you agree with Jesus or you live for Jesus or you acknowledge Jesus versus you reject Jesus. And so there's going to be friction. And he's about to bring it into the home. Uh, well, let's go, let's go ahead and sweeten the pot. Look in verse 35. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes or enemies shall be they of his own household. Well, that would be kind of like... Um... Your, your Christian walk and your family's not. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're walking strong and your family's not. There's conflict. There's, There's conflict right there. So in peacemaking, do you compromise your relationship with Jesus or do you understand my relationship with Jesus is going to create turmoil? It's mm -hmm. what he tells, his, uh, he tells the disciples going out. They're not going to like you. So if I'm a peacemaker, then I, I seek for peace with people, but not at the expense of my change, relationship with I'm Jesus. I'm going to change my ways to make you happy to keep peace. As long as it's about Jesus. As long as it's about Jesus. Because exactly. if somebody wants to put 350 sheets of toilet paper on a roll versus 600, <laughs> we may not like it, but that that's not a reason to draw swords. You need a hobby. <laughs> I think that's interesting to know. We need to know that. The, that and the little things on the end of the shoestring. Yeah, that's called an aglet. It's an important piece of information. Um, but Jesus is not telling us two different things here when he says, I didn't come to bring peace. The, the peacemakers are going to be those who endeavor to live out righteousness, to live in justice. But even that guided by Jesus is going to do what? It's going to cause conflict with other people because justice, according to some of the people in the world, isn't justice. Mm -hmm. Their idea of justice is letting the criminal go free. And, and the <laughs> there was a story, and it's, it's been a while, but a young man who pretended to be a woman or pretended to be female, dressed up like a girl, went into the girl's restroom slash locker room he raped one of the girls in there and the guy's mama because he's a guy his mama said she should have fought back harder uh -oh. yes she did yeah there's no making peace with that so as peacemakers and i'm going back to that passage in matthew because when you when you endeavor to make peace you never compromise biblical values for peace because there's not going to be peace you can't make a deal with satan and win or expect anything good to come from it but he's warning his disciples in this though that when you go out proclaiming the gospel people are going to get upset and nowadays they want they like jesus but they don't want the bible oh you you can embrace jesus but don't bring that bible stuff into it and any time you bring Jesus and what he stands for, it is going to create friction. I knew a set of parents, their son and their daughter-in-law weren't going to be full-time missionaries, but they thought they were, they believed they were obeying the Lord and going on short-term mission trips. And that mom and dad were so angry how in the world can they go put themselves in other countries and their lives at risk? They're giving their lives for Jesus if that's what it takes. And they couldn't understand that. So to keep peace in the family, do we not do what Jesus wants us to do? No, there is no making peace with that. Following Jesus in that, in that sense is not going to make sense to some families. You don't. You don't put yourselves in harm's way. That's why the little guy that paddled his canoe to that little island and the people nobody's ever touched. I'm not saying far or against, but if he heard from Jesus that he's supposed to bring the gospel to him, more power to him. And I know this, that when he died, if he was obeying Christ's command, 
Christ was ready to receive him into heaven. Sometimes things don't make sense to us, but you don't compromise Jesus as a way to make peace because that's not true peace. And getting rid of, by the way, your earthly enemies doesn't bring peace either. Because as soon as you get rid of your earthly enemies, you find out you don't agree with other people. It's like, how far can we divide? Mm -hmm. When you no longer have a common enemy, then you get angry with each other. It's interesting that we would turn to Venezuela and Maduro for help in a time such as this. And I'm like, yeah. what? Mm -hmm. Did I just step off into some wormhole somewhere? I don't. It just doesn't make sense to me. You don't ever compromise Christianity simply to be at peace with people, period. So Jesus is not in conflict here. And that's what he's telling his disciples. Look, going out and confessing me is going to bring troubles. In fact, Jesus' own family tried to get him to shut up a number of times. People said, Jesus, your family's outside. He says, here's my family. They were trying to get him out of there. He's making a name for himself. He wasn't trying to do that at all. He said, I came not to send peace. And that word sin there is not send in the sense of as ushering it out, but to, to bring it what they were hoping for, freedom from the Romans. And even at that, even if he had done it, he wouldn't have done it right. He was bringing them peace with God and they didn't like that either. There was nothing Jesus could have done right that would have pleased the Pharisees other than as if he was one of them as they are. But then he would have had to be in the same stripe because they had their own little divisions as well. So when the gospel goes out, he's telling his disciples here, this is Peter, James, and John, um, Matthew, Bartholomew, Judas, the other Judas, all of these, that when you go out, People are going to despise you. There's going to be friction. It is not going to be pleasant just because you're sharing the gospel. In other words, you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone. And every one of you knows what that feels like. If you've ever shared the gospel, you know what it's like to get out of your comfort zone. It's never scary to tell it to our grandkids. I, nobody, I've never had anybody say, man, I was intimidated to share the gospel with my eight-year-old but sharing it with your buddies or people you just randomly run into in the store, it, it calls you to get out of your comfort zone. <clears throat> I don't think it's got as much to do about personality because I'm just as prone not to say anything to people as I am to make some comment and, you know, be snide with a remark or make a joke or, you know, whatever, you know, man, you think this line can move any slower, or, you know, just whatever, get people talking. If we're not afraid to make light talk or banner, why would we be afraid to share Jesus? It's because we know this. Not everybody's excited to hear about Jesus. Oh, you're just trying to bring in your stuff. You, you want one better? I'll top you one even better. <clears throat> bring up that Jesus is the only way to a practicing Catholic. I'm going to tell you, you mean to tell me my mom and dad didn't raise me right? Now, you don't ask me a question like that. If they taught you that you could go through Mary to get to heaven, they did not raise you right. You were lied to. If a Baptist preacher told you you could get to heaven by how much money you put in the plate, you were lied to. By attending church, you were lied to. That's where the issue rubs. We don't want confrontation. We, we, we despise that, but Jesus calls for that. If you, if you stand for Jesus, you're going to be. There are people right now, kid you not, that think we're the child abusers for raising First Baptist Christian Academy kids, teaching them that God made them male and female and that a man marries a woman and that they have kids, that we're the abusers. Really? <clears throat> I mean, and you know, if you try to talk with one of them, you know what it's going to be like. They don't know restraint. 
The gospel is going to always, if you're sharing the true gospel, it is always going to bring division. It is going to bring troubles. It is going to divide families. It is going to make enemies. So here's your choice. Look at verse 37. Here's what he says you got to do. He that loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that takes not his cross, in other words, he loves himself more than Jesus and follows after me is not worthy of me. There's only room in your life for one devoted love. Only one devoted and it's Jesus. Yeah, but I love my wife, but you're supposed to love Jesus more. I've even uh, to told a few people when we were in couples counseling, you need to find a, spou a future spouse that loves Jesus a little bit more than you do. Now, you see how that would work. Nobody could ever get married then because we would always be on the lookout for somebody who loves Jesus more, but they get my point. You want a spouse who loves Jesus first because if they love Jesus first, the decisions they make are going to be good decisions. If they love you, you don't know what kind of decisions they're going to make because we heard this all the time. I fell out of love. I'll change them. <laughs> That's even worse. Yeah. <laughs> what do they say? He marries her hoping she never changes and she marries him hoping to change him. It don't work. It don't work. <laughs> just wasting your time. But it's perpetual. The younger people always think we can make it work. And it doesn't work that way. So if you find somebody that loves Jesus, guess what? You found a good catch. Preachers used to be one of the most trusted positions. Used to be. It is no longer. If you had to trust a preacher, you want one who loves Jesus or one who loves himself more. Jesus. Anything that we do, it should be that we love Jesus more. The reason why I will take stands that I take is because I love Jesus more. I'm not saying I, I enjoy every stand I take. You know, writing a letter to the governor probably isn't always the wisest thing to do, and it's not always the fun thing to do. But I felt compelled to tell him, you don't tell me, period. We get our marching orders from heaven, not from a governor. Right. If we choose to meet, that's up to us. Mm -hmm. And you don't get to make a decision that we don't get to meet because you think it's not good for our health. That's, you don't choose church attendance or whether it's good for your health because we could go back. Do you know where people's hands have been that you shake okay, hands? that's. <laughs> I know it's a good soft button, but my, my point being, every time you're around people anywhere, I mean, you like to go to Death Valley in Baton Rouge. How many people are there on any good game? How many thousands? Man, if somebody coughs within a 10 foot radius, you're all coughed on. <laughs> <laughs> I've never thought about that before. That's quite fascinating. I've never considered that aspect of it before. Oh, she, I've, I've never thought about that. That's going to be, I'm going to think about that. You ever thought about that, Reed? I never thought about it. It's true when you, two bits, four bits, six bits of peso off or whoever stand up and say so and everybody says so. And imagine if we could see the micro filter there, it would just be like a little fog goes over the stadium at that point. But we can't live in fear of even our health. The early Christians didn't hide because of their health. Their health wasn't getting a disease. It was what? Losing your head. We don't take our orders from the govern government. Canadian pastors don't take their orders from the Canadian Parliament. Canadian right. Parliament says you can't speak against homosexuality. They're fining on five, ten, and fifteen thousand dollars in occurrence, if not more. Who do you get your orders from? Jesus said, you got to love me more than anybody else. And it's hard when you look at your grandkids to think of it in that terms. But the grandkids need a grandma and a grandpa that love Jesus more than they love them. That's what's most important. Now, we know at this at least, 
Peter's married. How do we know Peter's married? You know. What? His mother-in-law was sick and Jesus healed her. You think she's thrilled every time Peter runs off following Jesus? Is it always convenient? I doubt it. But who does Peter got to love more? He's got to love Jesus more. Think about that. Your spouse comes to you and says, um, I'm going to be gone for a week. I'm going to mission trip. I'm believing Jesus is wanting me there. Oh, Sorry? Fishing. Fishing. <laughs> Mission trip. <laughs> Maybe didn't care. No, I can't. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you tell her fishing trip again, it's probably not going to go well. But some people make the choice to raise their kids in a Christian school versus a public school or versus a, a halfway um, Montessori school or whatever you want to stick in the middle there. Uh, if they believe that Jesus is leading them to put them in a public school, then we're supposed to support them. Conversely, if they believe Jesus is leading them to raise their kid in a Christian school, we should support their decision. Right. Now, most people think, well, they're going to have a tougher time in the public school. Au contraire. I'll tell you what's more dangerous than a public school. A school that poses itself as Christian school that teaches their kids the same thing they would have learned in the public school under the umbrella of Christianity. We've got to love Jesus more. When I preach, you, this Italian guy is what we had last night. You better hope I love Jesus more than I show you what I care about you. Because if I want to tiptoe around, I may not want to hurt your feelings or make you feel bristled. So I might want to make things a little more palatable at the expense of your spirituality. Really? You better, want, you better just say, Brother Luke, don't add to what the Lord telling us. But by all means, tell us what the Lord's told us. That's what you should be hoping for, irrespective of whose toes it steps on. Right. It's not fun stepping on people's toes, really. I mean, I like having fun with people. Don't get me. I love being jovial, but it is not fun hurting people. That's all the same thing. Yeah, but unfortunately, the people that typically want me to call a spade a spade don't like it when I call them a spade. <laughs> it's okay if I'm chewing on the people out the door, but what if I'm calling down the hypocrisy in here? But in that more or less the way people want religion nowadays. Exactly. They want it. Well, you need to, you know, they're they're too busy. They're not worried about the plank in their eye. Not only now, that's not a modern problem. This but has been around since ever since. <clears throat> we haven't changed. What did you say earlier? There's nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. Nothing new. That's why you don't need to worry about history. We don't learn from it. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> you wouldn't learn about toilet paper. <laughs> I got a few brain cells left, and I'm not wasting them on toilet paper. Okay. <clears throat> I like history. I don't necessarily always like it, but Mr. Sharman. even then, we learn from history that all not that not all men love Jesus more than they love other things, and so they make foolhardy choices. And then we read in history about people that love Jesus more than they love their own life. Um, different history things I can send out on any Wednesday, but today was the one. If y'all remember the song, I've done this from before, 40 Brave Soldiers for Jesus, 40 Brave Soldiers for Christ. Today is supposedly the date that they died on the ice because they wouldn't sacrifice to Caesar, to Nero. And so they all were marched out onto the ice without any clothing so that they would freeze. And they were hoping to make them turn but the guys were willing to die. This is documented history. They were willing to die for Jesus. They weren't sacrificing to Caesar. They weren't doing it. Of course, then if you listen to the song, their song really makes it. One guy comes in off the ice. He's ready to sacrifice to Caesar. He gets near the fire. He falls over dead. And that's probably can happen because you warm up too quick and your body just can't handle it. Like going into cold too quick as well. And it changed one of the guards so much so that he ran out 
to make 40 soldiers even again. Do you love Jesus more than you love yourself? Now, look, he said it. If you don't love others less than me, you're not worthy of me. You've got to love him more than others, even when it creates friction, even if it's in your own home, even it's when it's your own self. Why? Verse 39, he that finds his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Just crossed my mind. This would be a good reply to those people that said, I'm going out to find myself. Jesus said, if you find yourself, you're going to lose yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to get loster than what you are. Um, but the world talks about finding yourself. No, you're supposed to lose yourself for Jesus. You're supposed to give up your desires, what you think and what you desire to be to follow after him. And it's not always easy. Turning your other cheek, loving your neighbors, you love yourself, being a peacemaker rather than a war stoker. You know, none of y'all ever just knocked a wasp nest crazy just because it's fun to watch them go on a tizzy, right? You never did that when you were little, did you, Reed? You didn't? Man, we would. Get a slingshot, stand back, just to... <laughs> And it's better when they're in the corner of the eaves because you really can't miss. Because if it ricochets, you're going to get them. If you hit them straight on, you're going to get them. They're, they're toast in the corner. Aunt Bev, can you walk past an Aunt Bev without kicking it? <laughs> um, I can't. Be named fireworks. <laughs> well, fireworks are even better. You give me fireworks when I was a kid and there's Aunt Bev. Of course. Now, did you do fireworks in Aunt Bev when you were a kid? Mm -hmm. What happens if they... Splatter. You get them all. On you. you get them all on you too. So we learn to get further away from. <laughs> gasoline down in front of an ant bed, and he let it sit there while they do a match on it. It exploded. I bet it was nice. Yeah, he had ants all. She don't remember any of your good stuff. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good myself, but I think her definition of good and mine and yours might be different. But really, it, is it easier to endeavor to make peace between other people or is it easier to stoke the flames? Some of that could be personality. Meaning? Some people are less into the stoking the stuff so even if it is a personality issue they're supposed to submit their personality that's right. to jesus that's right and that's what he's saying yeah so for some people it is a bigger there are some people that are naturally peacemakers right and so they don't understand what it means to poke right things and other people you can't walk by an ant bed without <laughs> kicking it yeah. and gigging it or whatever you want to say it so in all things, though, it's not always good to, to make peace because sometimes there needs to be conflict right. for the right reasons, but yeah. it needs to be conflict. You don't smooth over it. Well, he's saying this conflict's going to happen. You're not going out purposely saying, nanner, nanner, nanner. But I it's love gonna, Jesus, so get over it kind of a thing. But it's going to happen. Right. Anywhere you preach Jesus, it's going to happen. Yeah. Especially when you preach it as New Testament. Mm -hmm. You couldn't even follow Judaism and Jesus. You either follow Jesus or you follow Judaism, but you don't get both. Yep. You don't get Moses and Jesus. You either follow Jesus or you follow Moses. Take your pick. That's what Paul's arguing against the Galatians. You want to go back to Moses, but you can't do that. you got to follow Jesus and stick with him. That doesn't undermine the law by any stretch of the imagination. It undermined their understanding of what they practiced. It did. You've got to love Jesus more than any other thing we might say it this way you've got to be sold out completely to him and everything that you think you're going to lose you're going to gain instead that's what he says in the last part of verse 39 he that loses his life for my sake shall find it i can't prove it to you because they're all in heaven but i guarantee if stephen came up here right now he'd tell you trust me what you give up here isn't anything compared to what god has in store for you Thoughts before I move forward. Verse 40 then. 
He that receives you receives me. And he that receives me receives him that sent me. So if you receive the disciples, that means you receive Jesus. And if you receive Jesus, that means you receive the father. But if you reject Jesus, you reject the father. And if you reject Jesus's disciples, you reject Jesus. Let that sink in. This means Caiaphas cannot love the father as much as he would protest and say, I love the father. I love the father. No, he doesn't. Because if you love the father, who would you receive? You'll, you'll receive Jesus. <clears throat> this is why Muslims are completely wrong. Oh, they love the father, but they reject Jesus. No, if you really love the father, you're going to receive Jesus. Oh, but he was a good teacher. No, he was the son of God. No, God don't have any sons. Then you reject Jesus. You reject the father. That, and that's what you stay on target. You stay on target on Jesus. It doesn't matter about veils. It doesn't matter about what's Hillel or, or not. You stay on target. If you tell me you know the father in heaven, you're going to receive Jesus. This means Jews that don't trust Jesus really don't know the father in heaven. And they're not going to heaven when they die. It's all about Jesus. That's why we have to stay on target with that. Always bring it back to what you do with Jesus reveals what you do with the father. If you really believe the father, you're going to accept who he sends. And he's talking to his disciples. So no matter where James and John and Peter went, if they were accepted, and by the way, we saw that earlier in the chapter, if, if they open their doors to you, you, you speak peace upon the house, if it's a worthy house, if they're receiving you, then that means they would have received Jesus. But if they reject you, that means they reject the Father. It's not you that's being rejected if they don't listen to you. They're rejecting Jesus, which means they're rejecting the Father. And there's no amount of peacemaking I can make that any more palatable. If they don't receive Jesus, they don't know the Father. It, that's just the way it is. Yeah, but that means a lot of people died and gone to hell. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. If you don't know Jesus, you won't receive the Father. <clears throat> I thought about this and there really are no good earthly ex illustrations of this if Joe Biden sent Kamala Harris to see me I'm not sure I'd be too receptive and it's got more to do with politics but there was a time when we would say it this way you receive our ambassadors as you would receive our president, because that's what basically ambassadors are. Their president can only be in one place at one time. And so the ambassador is supposed to represent the president who is supposed to represent our will. And there used to be at least enough of a cohesiveness in our country that no matter whether you like the president or not, you respected the office. Because when you reject the office, you hurt all of us. That's as close as I can get to an earthly illustration because we know that there are rotten people. Um, we, I think we have a, a, a good sheriff. I mean, you might disagree with me, but I think we got a good sheriff. So if you reject his officers, you're probably not going to like him. But if you like him, you should like most of his officers. But somebody's easily going to say, yeah, but there's some bad eggs. Well, guess what there is in the middle of this group? There is a bad egg. His name is Judas. And Jesus already knows who he is. There are bad eggs in everything, but you don't judge the whole by the one. But it's easy to do. And you know, all them people over there, you know how they are. No, I don't. I don't know how the one that talked to me is. But I don't know how they all are because I haven't sat and talked with all of them. We need to be Abraham, careful. Huh? Abraham even begged God for five good people in Sodom. Out of the whole city. Out of the whole city. The problem is he couldn't find five. There were four. 
One of them turns to a pillar of salt. The other two come up with a way to sleep with their dead so that they don't die childless. And then Peter writes, righteous lot. Yeah. Yeah. When you figure that one out, let me know. If I am sent by the Father, no, excuse me, back up. If I am sent by Jesus and you reject me, you reject Jesus. And if you reject Jesus, you reject the Father. Now, if I'm not sent by Jesus, rejecting me doesn't matter. There are some people that are going to be claimed to be sent by Jesus. And what did Jesus warn his disciples? They're going to say, I'm out in the wilderness. Come see me. He says, don't you go out there. I'm not in the wilderness. You got to pay attention to what's, what they're speaking, what they're saying, how they're teaching, how they're living. All of that factors in. The apostles going out with Jesus's blessing here. They're going out without food, their extra food. They're going out without extra clothes. They're bringing the gospel. They're going to live on the gospel. Man, what a testimony. They gave it all up to follow Jesus. Nothing would be holding them back. Nothing would be hindering them. So you keep that in mind when you go into verse 41, where he says, he that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Give me an Old Testament example of somebody who received the prophet and that was blessed because of it. Nineveh. Huh? Nineveh. Uh, yeah, but I was thinking more personal, but, but Nineveh actually would be a good, in spite of Jonah's response to them, Nineveh would actually be an excellent because they received Life. Jonah as, as God speaking to them and God blessed them. They weren't destroyed till later on, a couple of generations later. So yeah, Nineveh would be a great example. I'm thinking of Correct. And the prophet of God said, before you make your food, can you make me some? And she said, yeah. And I like how the Bible says she was gathering a few twigs. She wasn't going to be cooking much, but she did. And then the food never ran out for almost a year. I have to go back and look the whole story up closely to see. But they had plenty to eat. And she could have looked at and said, man, I can't share anything because if I share what I got, we won't have anything. But she shared not of her abundance, but even as her lack. And she was blessed because of it. Now, that ticked off the religious leaders. Why? Was she Jew or Gentile? She was Gentile. And there was more faith in the Gentiles than there was in the Jews. Maybe as Christians, we need to pay attention to that. So to receive the prophet in the name of the prophet, you will receive a prophet's reward. And he that receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. There is blessing in receiving prophets of God and people who walk in righteousness. It, it, it naturally follows. There is blessing in doing that. Now, when you consider this, this really wasn't something that would apply to the disciples now, would it? Because basically he's telling somebody that if you receive these guys, you'll be blessed, right? That's not important for the disciples to know, is it? Look in verse 42. Pay attention. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of the little ones, one of these little ones, a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. In other words, these little ones here are his disciples. So he's talking to the people that are outside watching and says, if you treat them as my learners, you won't lose your reward either. He shifted his audience in verse 40, 41, and verse 42. Notice he's gone from the sending out to those receiving. How are we supposed to receive prophets of God? We're supposed to receive them, accept them. We're supposed to listen to what they have to say. People that walk in righteousness, we're supposed to listen to what they have to say. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name, only because they're my disciple. Now, we don't think much about that because a cup of water, I mean, there's water faucets everywhere. Wasn't like that back then. A cup of cold water didn't even come from the refrigerator. It might have come from a little cooling system or maybe a cistern that was dark and it was cooler, wasn't hot. 
but he talks about a blessing for receiving those whom he sent. And this is very important. We need to be careful in who we accept and who we reject. Oh, I couldn't reject the wrong person. Israel did. They rejected twice. They rejected John the Baptist, and then they rejected Jesus. Now, what is utterly fascinating, the stupid fishermen didn't. The stupid, unlearned, uneducated fishermen received John the Baptist, and they walked with him. They were his disciples. We saw that in, in the Gospel of John. And then when Jesus comes along, they follow Jesus. But they were uneducated and unlearned. But they recognized righteousness when it stood before them. You know the truth when people are speaking it. You know. You've been in church long enough. You've read the Bible. You, If you claim to be a Christian, the Holy Spirit's residing within you. And you listen and you hear what they're saying. You know if it resonates or not. Accept them. Because if Jesus sends somebody and you reject them, you reject Jesus. This is very real for the religious leaders. Very real. Because they're going to oppose the disciples. They're going to oppose Paul. They're going to oppose Jesus. The religious people are going to oppose God. We may not claim to be religious uh, in the bad sense, but we might. Yeah, I'm religious. I go to church. I, I love Jesus. And we don't mean anything by the baggage that goes with the word religious at all. But that means we've got to be careful about who we accept and who we reject. What if they have a speaking and a speech impediment? And whatever they do gets on your nerves. If they're preaching and they're sent from the Lord and they're preaching the truth, guess what? You better get over right. your preferences. Right. What if their skin color is different? I'm not talking even black. What if they're uh, Middle Eastern? I did email Maxim today. Haven't heard back from Maxim. This is the longest I've ever gone without hearing from him when I've emailed him. So I'm not sure what's. Some of y'all were here when we had Maxim here before. I struggle trying to understand him, anybody that speaks foreign language. I got hearing aids because I don't hear well, but you speak a foreign language and it's difficult. But he was a blessing. He was enough of a blessing that when he got near us, we all, I say we all, those of us, we went to hear him at uh, Emmanuel before it was destroyed by the hurricane. He's not one of us, he's a Russian. If he's sent by Jesus, guess what? If you reject him, you'll lose your reward. If you accept him, you're blessed. There is blessing in receiving those who come in Jesus' name. There is blessing in receiving them who do the work of righteousness. And we need to be aware of that in our minds, in our hearts, in our thoughts. That if we reject who Jesus sends, we reject him. If we accept who Jesus sends, we accept Jesus. It's evidence. Oh, her neighbor said he wasn't religious, but he was spiritual. Uh, that doesn't mean anything either. Thoughts or ideas? We're not going into chapter 11. We're running out of time. <clears throat> okay, so you're at work and your boss asks you to do something that is illegal, but it's not just illegal. You find it actually immoral. Do you do it? Let's play with a real, a real thing today. You can't believe everything, but if some of these Russian soldiers are telling the truth, we're just following orders that don't float for God. Following orders never floats with God. If orders are to do something immoral, and by immoral I mean unbiblical, you don't do it. You don't. Jesus wouldn't have us use immoral ways to promote the gospel. You don't do that. So if you love Jesus more, what do you tell your general? Respectfully, sir, no. You could say it that way. 
<laughs> well, <laughs> that would probably be the best way to say it. <laughs> um, you know, it. You imagine standing up in the operating room and being the lone voice of morality, what that would be like if it came down to it. It could cost you a job. It, it could cost you lots of stuff. But do you love Jesus more? That it, That is why hypocrisy is hypocrisy, whether it's American version or whether it's the Russian version. Both of them fall short of the glory of God. Right. And that is why I'm so adamant about getting people to understand I'm not saying Vladimir Putin is a good guy by any stretch of the imagination, but I do understand this. He doesn't want missiles in his backyard any more than I want Russian missiles in Cuba. I, I get that. Can you imagine if we had invaded Cuba? Now, we've got the high road there. We can say, look, we fought you. Um, Financially and politically or however the Cold War actually, but we didn't invade Cuba because we disagreed with what you did. So we've got that little bit of high road. But if it was wrong for Russia to put missiles in Cuba and we I, I say, yeah, then it would be wrong for NATO to put missiles in Ukraine. No matter how much you dislike Putin. Hypocrisy is hypocrisy, and that's what we've got to learn. It doesn't matter the color of the person. It doesn't matter the position of the person. It doesn't matter their nationality. It's not right for us because we're Americans and wrong for them because they're Russian. we got to get past that. Right's right. Wrong's wrong. Or in this case, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And we need to make sure we say that. A balanced scale honors God. You don't have to agree with me politically, but you've got to. You've got to agree there. God doesn't have dishonest scales. They're balanced, and it doesn't matter what you look like. Balanced scales are what we're supposed to strive for. Judge yourself rightly. Get the plank out of your own eye so that you can see the speck in your brother's eye. And I'm not calling Putin a brother by any stretch of the imagination. He's far from it. That's why I pray for Maxim and Miss Olga. They're sharing Jesus on the streets of Moscow. That's contrary to everything Russia stands for. Uh, I'm burdened for them. Did you say last night they're part of the Jews for Jesus? Yes, they are. And Moscow is, is their home base. That's He's a he's a, actually a physicist. He's no slacker. He's very intelligent, but he spends his time on the streets aiming at Jews, catching anybody that will come along, right. but specifically going after the Jewish community that lives in Moscow. He may be a Russian, but if he loves Jesus, guess what? He's our brother. His wife's our sister. And I would think, even though you're an American, if you showed up in Moscow, he would hug you and love on you and treat you just as I would want him to treat us, as we would treat him over here. I have no doubt in my mind. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Can you imagine? I mean, nobody in here old enough to imagine this, to live through it. Imagine bringing in a Japanese preacher in 1942 to share in a Southern Baptist pulpit. <laughs> Ooh. But you know what? If they are a believer in Christ and proclaiming the gospel, Jesus just said we're obligated to listen and receive them. This, this can be challenging. God doesn't look at the, uh, the nationality. He looks at the heart. Well, we don't look at the heart. We look at the nationality. I know. <laughs> but we, it, it's the heart. Yep. As we pray, we want to remember to pray for Miss Jacqueline. Did we hear anything more than what I already know? So they won't know the results yet. They think she's torn at least her ACL, if not her meniscus uh, and, and her skiing. Both of them. Ooh. So um, this is their daughter. 
and uh, Jacqueline is normally the one that takes care of Zeke. And so that having that and Zeke could be a problem. <laughs> I don't know how you can keep up with a young kid and have your knees messed up, uh, but we need, do need to pray for her. Uh, wish her a speedy recovery as we get ready to pray. And I know there are other things on your heart. So as we bow our heads, I'm going to be quiet for just a few moments, let you lift up your hearts to the Lord, and then I'll leave this in closing. Father, I would ask you to grant us humility, but I recognize that humility is a choice on our behalf. It's a decision that we make. Father, help us to be humble enough before Jesus that we will submit our lives and our plans unto him for as much as we will trust our souls unto him. Help us to truly be faithful witnesses, but to those who bring your word and truth that truly do come in your name, help us to be receptive. Father, I'm just like the other person. Sometimes I don't want to hear the truth. My flesh rebels against it. But I need to hear it. Help me to be receptive to those you send in my path. But above all, help me to understand that there is nothing on this planet that is worth losing my soul over. Help me as Paul said, to count all things as dung that I may gain Christ. And Father, it's encouraging to know that the men that you sent out were simple, ordinary men. And if they could walk in obedience, there's no excuse that I could raise up that would be legitimate. That I can be just as faithful to the task that you've called me to as they were. Help me to love Jesus more than anything else that I see. And Father, I pray for Jacqueline. Lord I, Lord, I imagine she's in pain. I know it's difficult to get around and to walk. We're asking you to intervene. We're asking you to touch her body, Lord. And we're, we're asking that you would help her through that pain, Lord. We know that you've designed pain to let us know something's wrong. We're asking you to help her to not hurt so bad. And that you would give the doctors wisdom to take care of her and get her back on her feet in no time. I pray for those that will be ministering to her, Lord, that you would give them good health. And that very soon she would be able to do the things once again that she likes to do. We thank you that we can bring <clears throat> our troubles to you, but we also bring praises to you. We thank you for saving us from our sins. We thank you that you saved us as we were to make us what we are and what we're going to be. We thank you that you have shown us grace and you have shown us mercy day after day. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning and that you are faithful. You are a good God and we honor you for that. Thank you for loving us with an eternal love. Help us to be so loving that we can't help but share Jesus with anyone who will listen. We pray this in that wonderful name of your only blessed son, and the only name whereby we can be saved. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>